So good morning. All right. All right. It was a cleanse. My name is Brandon. I am the youth minister here at Fellowship of the Rockies, and Pastor Albert is currently on a staycation. So he is spending time with his family, so I am filling in for him this morning. Well, it's a good thing or a bad thing? Well, yet to be determined, I guess. Oh. Um, this morning I want to talk about something truly amazing. Uh, something that's not really comprehensible, something that's kind of unfathomable, something that is un... We are unworthy of it, yet it is given to us anyways. And that is Jesus' love. All right. Um, has anybody in here... There's one thing that, difference between, that differs between the love that we have and the love that Jesus gives us. Is there anybody here who has maybe thought about their spouse or maybe even their kids that you are too hard to love right now? Anybody ever thought that? I know for sure the kids because I work with your kids and I know that sometimes they can be hard to love. And one thing that I learned is when maybe a student is being hard to love, you kind of, you do one of these. And this is, you're being too hard to love right now, so I need to tap into, God, uh, into God's unconditional love to love you right now. And I learned that because my youth pastor used to do that to me. So a trait carried on, I guess, yeah. And sometimes the kids do it to me too. I don't know why, but uh, sometimes they do. I guess I, I can be unlovable. I think we can all be unlovable, and I think that's one of the amazing things about God's love is that no matter how unlovable we may be, God's love for us is always there. Um, I'm going to start in the beginning, um, and I'm, I don't know if it's like a new, like when you're learning how to preach, if it's something that you do, but it's like Bible hopping, so we've got a couple different passages and I want to ask you to stand, but I'm not sure which one to ask you to stand for. So I'll ask you to stand for the first one, because that's right now. And that will be Genesis chapter 1, way in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, is where we'll start, and we will read through verse 30. All right, so... Got to give my Bible a little closer to my eyes, I guess. Uh, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on this earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth, which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw that all he made, God saw all he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning and this opportunity that we get to dive into your word and learn about your love. And God, thank you so much for your love. Your computer. It's so, <laughs> it's so undeserving to us, Lord. Um, but thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. That was God saying, hey, shh. <laughs> All right, there's a few things I want to look at in that passage. Um, first, this was the sixth day. So this was the last day that God worked. He rested on the seventh day. So mankind was the last thing that he had created. And it's kind of cool to see that because, as it appears to me, God made the plants. He made the animals. He made the stars. He made everything for mankind. He wanted to perfect his, uh, his creation and then put man in the middle of it and then gave it to us. Now God is all-knowing and he knew that man would fall. 
He knew that everything that he had made and that he had given us would be destroyed by our sin and our desires to do wrong. Yet he still gave them to us. Now that's to me, shows love. Because, I don't know about you, but if I were to create something, say I created a painting, or no, no, money, not spaghetti. Horrible example. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to use money for an example. If somebody came up to you and asked you for money, and you knew that this person was going to just blow the money and not use it on what they needed to. Like they come to you and say, hey, I need to make my car payment or I need to make my, I need to make my house payment, my rent or utilities. But you know that if you give this person money that they were just going to waste it away, it would be kind of hard to give them the money. For me, at least, I won't speak for you guys, but for me it would be kind of hard to give them the money. And God created this amazing world knowing that mankind was going to fall and that the world would crumble because of decisions that man has made. And he still gave it to us. Um, that is a love that is unfathomable to me. Because I cannot relate to that love. Because I cannot love that much, I guess. So I, I can love a lot, but not as much as God loves me. So uh, God gave us the choice. As you know, uh, we had the tree of life and then the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he said, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we ate from that tree. Uh, after eating from the tree came man saying, it was woman that you gave me. And then woman said, it was the serpent. He tricked me. All this finger pointing going on. And God said, wait, okay, you guys did what I said you weren't going to do. And we all got a punishment. Women, you know, painful child labor and man work in, the, work in the ground and the soil and the serpent had to slither on the ground and everything. In that moment of time when we disobeyed God, God had every right to wipe us out and either start over or just say, hey, you know what? I'm not, you did not do what I said, so you for all eternity have been punished. But instead, God protected us, okay? Another act of love. First, he created us and gave his creation to us to rule over. First act of love. Second act of love, he protected us. And this is where we kind of jump a little bit to Genesis chapter 3, 22 through 24. Uh, says, Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out and at the east of the garden of Eden he stationed a cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Now that sounds kind of harsh, you know, God does not want us to live forever now, so it kind of sounds like he, we've been put to death. And in a way we kind of have, I guess, but that was all an act of love because we had fallen away from God and we were, we, we had set ourselves apart from him and he wanted there to be a way to get back to him. He did not want us to live forever separate from him, so he cast us out and he is protected the tree of life. He put an angel with a flaming sword in all directions there at the tree of life so we could no longer eat from it. That is pretty loving. I don't know about you, but when somebody hurts me, I want to usually hurt them back. And I know I'm making myself sound like a terrible person, not very loving and wanting revenge, but when somebody hurts you, the first instinct is revenge. You get angry and you're just like, okay, you know what? I want this person to feel what I feel. or I want this person to go through what I went through or what they put me through. Yet God says, okay, you disobeyed, but there's still a way. He made another way. Um, which kind of leads into the next, not quite verse yet, but it leads to the beginning of the salvation of man, which is kind of what that first one was. The salvation of man, where God sent his son down to take on flesh. 
Now, as glorious as the story of Jesus' birth is, it's great, our Savior came, um, but the way that he came wasn't as glorifying as it should have been. Uh, Jesus was born in a barn. And <laughs> I had a really cheesy joke that I was going to say, but then I didn't have the... I was going to say, I wonder if he leaves every door open. You know, that's why there's always an open door, you know. Cheesy, skipping it. All right. <laughs> so Jesus was born in a, st in, in a barn, and when I think of the Savior coming, I know this is what uh, a lot of people back then had a hard time believing, is when I think of my Savior coming, I see him on, like, a horse that's on fire and chariots and glory and just everyone just dropping down and praising him and being like, God, you are amazing. But he chose a barn. And I think that was to really show um, the level that it must have taken to save us because God had to become fully man as well as fully God. So he came into a world of uh, pain, suffering. Uh, he endured temptation. He, in, uh, he endured the pain. And uh, everything that we go through, he had to go through. Um, he, however, did it perfectly. Um, and this kind of actually goes to into the video that I have for us this morning to kind of show a little how God feels about us. <laughs> 